Awesome. Thanks, Coach G. Uh, first thing I want, I want to make sure that you guys all uh, are staying safe out there. I, you know, I appreciate you guys coming in here. And just like we were talking about earlier, I don't know who was in the room when we started this all up. This is a unique time of year for us, you know, to be in this situation and at home and not with our guys during spring ball, but spending more time with our family. So I definitely want, you know, to – to, to reach out to you guys and, 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 and hope you guys are all staying safe in this situation. Um, it does provide us a, a unique opportunity to meet with one another because we're all dealing with the same thing at the same time. Um, so it provides us opportunity to learn and grow and expand and, and do all that type of stuff. Uh, for me personally, uh, I'm going to talk about bump technique, but I really, I'm really opening it up to more like teaching progression and what my teaching progression is, how it, how it has been developed throughout the year, um, and, and kind of going from there. Uh, so uh, what you guys see right now is all my social media contact, my, my email. Definitely take a snapshot of that. Uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime after this if you had any more questions or anything else that I have kind of posted out there in the past. As Coach G says, I do I do, do a lot of social media online um, and throw some drill tapes out there. Um, and and kind of and kind of just spark interest. I really use it for recruiting. It's an amazing avenue to get in touch with those young kids um, and, and just show them a little piece of what to expect when they come to Sac State. Um, first thing I want to do, I wanted to introduce our, our coaching staff. They do an amazing job. Some of the success that we had this last year is basically from you know the, our our head coach all the way down to our janitor. I mean, uh, these guys coming out here and working together this this last year has been unbelievable. And then we had, we had a brand new addition, Malcolm Agnew just joined our staff recently in the last month. Um, he just drove over with his family um, and is moving in and, and, and trying to get settled in Sacramento. But these guys do an awesome job. And, and obviously we wouldn't be where we were last year, winning the big sky, going on to the playoffs for the first time in school history without these guys. So I wanted to make sure that they got noticed too with this. Okay. So talking man, man to man techniques. Um, when I break down techniques in general, I break it up into three different categories. We have up techniques, off techniques, and edge techniques. So basically an up technique would be what we're gonna talk about today. Our motor mirror technique or motor technique or off technique will play a little bit of off man, a slide catch or a true catch, depending if we're, if we're playing at a nickel position or we're walking down as a safety. Um, our edge techniques, you know, all depends if we're on a on a tight end or if there's an end over formation and we're playing off uh, off a of space or we're tucked into the box. Um, so we break those techniques down into those three main categories and we kind of go from there. So with me, bump in general, bump technique, for, especially for the cornerback position, is broken up into two different type of techniques. You have hard techniques and you have soft techniques. Um, a hard technique is like what you most people call a pier step or a jump press. They're, they're going to be physical at the line of scrimmage. And I'm going to deter the wide receivers physically, laterally down the line of scrimmage somehow, some way. A soft technique is I'm giving ground at the line of scrimmage. I'm going to show my physical, my, my body presence, and I'm going to reroute you by my, my position against you while you transition down the field. Okay? So today I'm, I'm concentrating in motor, mirror, or motor technique. But the other techniques uh, we also use in different type of man-to-man -man coverages. Okay? So overall teaching progression. This is how I go through everything. It doesn't matter if I'm teaching, you know, cover two, man-to-man, -man, cover three, um, all that. Uh, it doesn't matter what coverage it is or what technique it is. We go through these same basic four stages of things. Okay. Um, First and foremost, your alignment and assignment, you know, where you're supposed to be on any given call on the field and how you're supposed to execute what you're supposed to do depending on that call, on pass, run, play action pass, et cetera. Um, your stance and start, you know, how do you get lined up? Uh, your read, you're going to hear me talk about primary key and secondary key. I always try to concentrate the DB's eyes in the smallest detail as possible and try, and try to keep their eyes focused in one stationary target from place to place. Um, and, and then I'll teach them how to react when they see A, they got to do this. If they see B, they got to do that. And so you're going to hear me talk about primary key, secondary key in, the, in this uh, presentation. And finally, your finish. Um, the, fun, the fun thing about this is your alignment assignment takes, takes no physical ability at all. 
all my guys, all the guys in our room, you know, matter, no matter if it's safeties, nickels, corners, they all got to understand where they align and what, what their assignment is before they even touch the field. Your stance and start is all about your effort. We're going to get tired. We're going to get, you know, in a, in a bad position. We're going to have to play a hurry up offense, but getting in a great stance and understanding your start and being consistent with that start technique, no matter what it is, bump off, whatever's that takes effort. That's all it takes. It doesn't take a skill set. Okay. Read and react. That's where the, that's where that skill set starts to differentiate. So my best guys, my guys that are going to be on the field all the time, the true starters are the guys that can read and react consistently and make the right plays over and over again. And then finally, you're finished. That's the standard that we're going to be known for. That's the standard that we're, what we're going to do. But also, that's what you put on the field. You know, it doesn't matter how a play starts. You might line up wrong. You might be in a bad stance. You know, your eyes might have been looking at the wrong thing. But at the end of the day, it's how you finish to that ball and how you finish and make that play that determines if we're going to be successful or not. So that's, that's my teaching progression. That's why I try to keep everything in. Um, and that's where I go for it when I'm breaking down technique or coverages or anything like that. Okay. So talking about motor technique, we talk about having a loose bump alignment. Okay. For me, a loose bump alignment is basically we're going to align that DB a good, you know, uh, half yard inside that wide receiver. Okay. That's a loose alignment. A tight alignment would be him kind of, head up onto that wide receiver or just slightly to a leverage piece. Why are we going to have a loose bump alignment is because we're going to end up giving ground at the line of scrimmage. So some of our, some of our weaknesses playing a, a soft technique is the fact that we're going to be susceptible to a quick inside breaking route because we're giving ground at the line of scrimmage. So I want to have that leverage. Some of our strengths about playing a, a motor technique is I'm going to be have an easier time staying on top of vertical routes. Therefore, I don't care about a speed release away from me. I'm, I'm already starting off with a vertical displacement by my footwork. Okay, so my inside leverage is going to help through that. Okay, so as he gets lined up, he, I want his uh, his basically his inside leg. If you look at his inside his inside foot or his inside seam of his foot will match this wide receiver's inside seam of his foot, okay? His eyes will be nice and low, okay? It will be on a good alignment aspect of being inside of that wide receiver or leverage side to that wide receiver. The core formation might be over here, and we might be outside leverage, but would still be playing a, a loose core, uh, loose uh, alignment off of him, okay? My assignment. My assignment for motor technique is assignment for any other man-to-man uh, call that we have or any man-to-man -man technique that we have my assignment doesn't change so therefore if we have if I have run to me um, I, I tell those guys they're a secondary support player that means that they got to fit off the crack um, we, we anytime we're in man coverage we talk to our guys it's my man my fit so if my man blocks down my fit is always outside if my man tries to block me I'm always outside of him so it's my man my my fit responsibility on any type of run away we talk about the rule of 21 meaning keep 21 people inside of you. Uh, do not allow somebody outside of you for a reverse or anything like that. And we, we, we concentrate their eye progression on uh, basically the look across and see reverse, that running back cut back, and then finally he's working to that far pylon away from you. Okay? Quick pass, we're not going to see the quarterback's quick pass action, the three-step drop or anything like that. We're just going to see a radical inside charge by that wide receiver. So we talk about primarily trying to cut off the inside route as soon as we see a quick inside charge by, by that wide out at the line of scrimmage. Drop back pass, obviously we're man-to-man. -man. And play action pass or boot, we have a universal rule. Anytime the quarterback is outside the pocket, we're told to plaster. If we're playing, if we're playing cover two, we tell the plaster high to low, deepest guy in your in your zone, no matter where it's at. Quarterback leaves a pocket, so those guys get to understand, you know, these rules. They understand that these rules do not change, man to man. Um, quick pass might might be a little bit different. You know, I'm going to break and drive to cut off the inside route, but um, I'm still trying to cut off the inside route. Uh, but it doesn't matter if we're playing bump or or off techniques; uh, they're all the same. Okay. Our stance, when we get into a motor, uh, when we get into a stance, we're going to want to be square. Okay. Our feet are going to be shoulder width apart. We're going to be toe-to-toe -to -toe relationship. Uh, some guys, uh, 
Some guys lack some type of athletic ability. And I was talking to another coach just last night about some motor uh, techniques and we're conversating back and forth on, on different ways to fix guys that might lack some athletic ability. And one way you could possibly do that is, is staggering their stance just very little bit. Um, and that allows them to get out a little bit. But in general, most of my guys will be feet shoulder width apart, toe to toe relationship. Uh, I, I really want their toes pointed straight ahead. Straight ahead. I don't want them pigeon toed at all because that causes way more um, things that I have to take care of later on. Uh, knees are bent, hips are bent. Um, I want their eyes high, and I want their hands above their knees as much as possible. Uh, most of my guys, they, when they first come to me, they they, they want to they want their hands down low. They think it's you know they got that swag that 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 DB whatever persona with them. But having their hands up, at least just above their knees, allows them to react a little bit better, you know, with their hands. Um, and then finally, you know, I want their weight dis distribution a little bit about 60-40 relationship. So when I'm talking about it, as we get into that line uh, alignment that you just saw before, when I talk about their feet shoulder width apart, I want their inseams of their feet right outside their, their armpits. So I don't want them too wide. I don't want them too tight. I want the inside inside seams of their feet underneath their armpits. Okay, I want that great bend that you see uh, between their ankles, knees, and that hip. And I want my weight dis distribution 60-40. All, all our bump techniques, we always are going to start our technique with our near foot step. That meaning that the step, the foot nearest to that wide receiver, no matter if the core formation is over here or the core formation is over there, but our near foot to that wide receiver is the first, first uh, foot that will leave. So if I'm playing a motor technique, this is the first step that I'm going to take with this foot back. If I'm playing a pure step, this is the foot that's going to take a lateral step. If I'm playing a jump press, this is the foot that's going to plant to drive to jump press. All our techniques are built off of the same footwork. So they understand when they're walking up to the line of scrimmage and they get into that great stance and they're going to start their motor that they understand, okay, I need to get my weight shifted just slightly 60, 40, you know, and have that, that inside foot or near foot ready to trigger and work whatever technique I am. That helps me with the false steps. You see a lot of guys jump start or, or take two feet up, two feet down before they work their way back. Well, that's because their weight obviously is a little bit back, but also they're triggering off of a movement and don't have any pre-planned of attack on how I'm going to step back with that first foot. Is my left foot? Is my right foot? What it is. I'm giving them a pre-plan of attack to move that right foot back and to work that motor. So that, that is going through that stance itself. Now our start. This is uh, for some of you guys who, who followed me or, or – or watch some of my social media stuff. I talked about bump technique. You need to have proactive and reactive footwork. Okay, everything is built at, built off of proactive and reactive footwork. Well, really, I can tell you the same thing as on off man. Okay, off man, the same thing. Proactive footwork, reactive footwork. All proactive footwork really is is I understand what I'm going to do before the snap even happens. I'm going to motor, or I'm going to peer, or I'm going to jump press. I'm going to do something. I know what I'm going to do until you put me on a reactive phase. Am I going to, am I going to mirror? Am I going to stem? I'm going to two hand shock you. That depends on your release. So our proactive footwork is this motor. Now, when we when I talk motor technique, it's more of a, uh, a in step back. It's not both feet have to be, one foot has to be on the ground at all time. I never want both feet off the ground. So I don't want a hopping mechanism. I want short six to eight inches, you know, footwork back. I really want hot feet. I don't want sliding feet. So, you know, most, most guys back in the day would start teaching backpedal to slide, you know, edge the grass, all that. I want hot feet. And the reason why I like hot feet is because sooner or later, that foot's going to have to take a step on the ground and I'm going to have to change direction. And I have a, a better plant when I do that compared to when I'm sliding, I have to reposition myself to open up. It's just little things that we've seen, you know, going through this technique over and over throughout the years. And, and tell you the truth, it was, it was a guy at, the, at my previous, uh, previous life or previous place that I coached at that had really good hot feet. And he always could transition in and out of stuff at, uh, after his motor. And that kind of got us triggering to get better at those hot feet instead of slide feet. But anyway, we want, we want to lift our toes. Uh, we want to be square, have a great base, and definitely never cross over, even on this motor phase of what we're doing. 
So one of the first drills that we work on is basically just starting the motor. Um, we'll put a guy straight up. So this will be me at some point. This might be another DB or, or, or whoever it is, but they're going to stand right there. We're going to get into a good alignment and we're just going to motor back. They're going to give them some visual key, a trigger. Okay. And he'll motor back. I do. Uh, I pretty much work all the drills that we, we do. It doesn't matter if we're playing motor mirror off man, you know, cover two. everything's built off of visual keys. Now, I do not try to yell at them, set, go, or, or turn, or, or in fact, I don't even wear a whistle out there. You know, I don't, if, don't even know if our head coach knows that. I don't do that. But everything is built off of visual keys. So as he moves, this guy needs to trigger. I need to teach this guy to, to visually see something and react somehow. So as he works backwards, I want to ha have good foot start. I want him to, to work that near foot step first work and to work straight back and to hold his leverage some of our younger guys okay some of our younger guys as they work back they'll tend to fall off that line even though this guy is not even moving he's just triggering him he's moving his hands and he's going to work straight back he will fall off that line because his vision right now is looking at the middle of a belt buckle instead of an edge and he naturally will push himself to the middle of his target okay and so we could teach that as he works back, I have him stop, don't move, look down. If you're off that line, you, you laterally change one direction or the other without any type of visual cue to push you that way or another. So that's an easy way for me to work on that. I, again, I want their hands as, as they get into this position above their kneecaps and, and ready to go no matter what happens. Okay? So I just basically talked about your alignment, your assignment, your stance, your start. Everything up above that is all mental or little or effort related. Now we're talking about your read and react. What am I visually going to be seeing? You know, how am I reacting to it? Okay. And how am I placing my body in the best position that I need to go? Okay. So when I break down read and react, it's always about a primary key. Again, a secondary key. Uh, our primary key in this situation is based off the wide receiver. You know, our secondary key is based off the wide receiver to the ball. So if that wide receiver is blocking, I got to get to the ball. Or if that wide receiver is running a route, I got to get to the ball. Okay? So that's our primary secondary key compared to off man. If I'm playing off man, my primary key might be the uh, quarterback's release from, the, the, uh, from center. My secondary key might be my man and his leverage point. Okay? So just understanding, developing those primary secondary keys will help your guys, you know, determine what they're supposed to be doing at a particular time. I also will change their eye progression and their footwork determining on what they see. So if they change their feet, if I change their eyes, I change their feet. So I'm going to talk about that here in a second. And then how they react is all our reactive based stuff that we talk about. Okay. So how do I drill everything? Okay, we're all in the same situation out there. We all we all break and we all break and we got our first practice of the week. We have, you know, five minutes to work bump man to man coverage. That's it, because I gotta spend five minutes on tackling. I gotta spend five minutes on uh, route progression or, or or a component calls where we're we're together with the safety. I got five minutes. So how do I maximize those five minutes? This is how I do it. Okay. I break everything up into three main phases. You have a read and release phase, a route recognition phase, and a finish phase. If they're not running a route, obviously you're, you got to get to the ball carrier. So you have a read and release, a block destruction phase, and a finish phase. And what I do is I compartmentalize the drills that we will go through. And, and those five minutes are in one of those phases. So we might be just working read and release for motor one day. And then next week, we'll come back and we'll work the route recognition phase. Okay? Or, or we'll come back and we'll work the finish phase through his hands and the in phase, out of phase drill, or however we need to do that. Okay? But what that does is allows me to bring their situation, bring the DBs and put them in that particular situation and say, this is what we're trying to get better at. Okay? And I'm going to go through those, uh, those things here in a second. These are all the drills that we will work for just bump motor mirror. So you see all your read and release drills, you see all your route recognition seals, your block destruction, your shock lock escape, shock lock squeeze, okay, and your finish, uh, finish phases. That, that your finish phases could be for any man to man. Okay, am I in, in phase, am I out of phase? It doesn't have to be for motor, you know, technique. It doesn't have to be pure step, it could be any man to man. How am I hand stabbing when I'm out of phase? How am I getting to the interception point? How am I coming up for the ball? That's easy. Okay, but everything above that, you read and release and your route recognition kind of has to do with whatever technique you possibly are working at. Okay. 
when we break down a release from the line of scrimmage and we truly look at the read and release, we take it down to five releases, okay? We talk it down to a speed release, a stem release, a break release, a juke release, and a vertical release. The vertical release real, rarely happens. It, it just it started coming up this last year, especially when guys, it's uh, wide receivers want to shock release you and try to try to come at you because they know that you're a motor mirror type organization or motor mirror type of DB, and they just want to run straight at you, shock you, pull you down and go out. So we had to develop a little bit from that. But most of the time, they're trying to avoid you somehow, some way, or push you somehow, some way. So a speed release for us is working away from our leverage point. So in this situation, it's real easy. I'm inside leverage. He's working to the outside. But if that was a nasty split or that, that wide receiver was close to the core formation and I was in an outside leverage, a speed release then would be working away towards the inside of that D, uh, inside of that core formation away from that DB. Okay? A stem release. This is when that wide receiver is working laterally on the line of scrimmage or pushing you vertically, but never commits his hips one way or the other. So he's working laterally, but he never commits on going on to the inside. He's just trying to get you off your line. That is our stem release. Okay? Our break release is him actually turning his hips and running down inside, usually seen on a crack or a under or a quick, you know, inside breaking route. Okay? A juke release, he goes outside first, so it looks like a speed release, but radically comes back quickly to try to get underneath you. So you, that quick slant you see in cover two sometimes, you know, you'll see it, you know, a slant or a quick route. We got to expect anytime we see a juke release, doesn't matter if we're motor meter or if we're playing, uh, if we're playing cover two, whatever it is, okay, that the ball is going to be out quickly. So we want to attack a juke release as much as possible. And then the vertical release is, is, like I said before, charging us straight ahead. Okay. So now I'm going to break down the releases and our footwork from that proactive footwork going into our reactive footwork. How do we re react to a speed release? Okay. So as I said, a speed release is working away from us. How do I react to it? We talk about mirror. Okay. A mirror, yeah, a mirror for me is just opening our hips at that 45 degree angle and working for depth to cut off that vertical route, especially at the cornerback position. We use the we use the same mirror technique as a nickel. If I'm playing catch technique and I have my inside leverage or, or and I'm working it and he speed releases away from me to the hash, he will still mirror to gain ground at that 45 degree angle to get to that collision point. So those mirror steps and this mirror terminology is used throughout the whole secondary. Biggest thing, coaching points, don't open up greater than 45. Younger guys will start, start to do this. They'll motor back, and then they'll flip their hips, and they'll work, and they'll mirror, shuffle, and shuffle vertically upfield. Well, that does us no good. We just open the gate, as most DB coaches talk about. Okay? Um, we always want to push with the opposite foot. So if my leverage side was here, and I had to mirror this way, I want to take this foot and push to get to where I need to go. I do not want to stick this foot in the ground and pull me across. Why not? Because when I stick that foot in the ground and pull me across, I tend to click heels and I, I end up two feet off the ground and two feet on the ground. I always want to have at least one foot on the ground at all times. Um, we're trying to stay as low as possible and I don't want to cross over run. I want to try to get at least two good 45 degree shuffles before I have to get into a crossover run. Here's my, here's my deal. Anytime I change their feet, I change their eyes. So if I went from a motor to a mirror, I want to go from a motor, central located hip, you know, placement, and I went to a mirror, my eyes are going to look to that far hip pocket now and, and look at that far hip pocket to see if it retraces back to me before I continue on with anything from there. So I'm changing his eye progression. He went from inside to far hip, okay, by their, their feet changing. So... We'll do this drill underneath the, um, underneath the shoots. We'll do it live or without the shoots. Um, but basically, uh, I'll show you this later on if we have time. But I'll put the DB basically on that white line right here. They'll be, they'll be right here. I'll be off of it slightly. I'll give them some type of visual key. And then I'll step away from their leverage. As I step away from their leverage, uh, as I gave them, excuse me, let me rewind. As I gave them that visual key, they motor back. As I step away from their leverage, he's getting to that mirror step. As he works to that 45, I want to see this foot stick in that dirt and really push for him to open up. I really started to start teaching this toe. If those first two steps, I would really like that toe to not open. 
If that toe opens, his hips open. If his hips open, he it's harder it, it, it's harder for him to regain back ground and come back inside to close off any type of juke release. So the first the first shuffle and the second shuffle, I really want to concentrate him keeping that toe square and to really get to that forty five degree angle as much as possible. All right. So that's our that's our mirror technique. Stem. So now we're going against that wide receiver attacking our leverage, but never committing his hips. Okay? As that guy attacks our leverage, we are going to stay square. We are not going to open up the opposite way. Okay? Uh, just some of the philosophy I have. If he if he goes away from my leverage, I will mirror. If he attacks my leverage, I will stem. It's very similar to playing off man. If he works away from my leverage, I will tilt to turn. If he attacks my leverage, I will stem to break. So it, it marries up to what they're, what they're doing in man-to-man -man when they're playing off as well, okay? So as this guy works laterally, okay, I want him to take that, his leverage foot now, the foot closest to that wide receiver, and stick that foot in the dirt and now work laterally inside and try to stay inside of him as quick as possible. If that wide receiver never turns his hips, he could continue to give slight ground because he knows that wide receiver is not breaking on the inside. He's just push stepping him or pushing his leverage. And then sooner or later, he's going to go vertical, go in or out. Okay? Um, so we will give a little bit of ground. Uh, we want to stay square. We don't want to open our hips. We don't, don't want to commit him one way or another. Again, he worked towards me. I'm going to now look at that near hip pocket and make sure I key that near hip to see if it disappears and I have to break and drive. So, Similar drill, I'm now behind them. I have a group of DBs over here. They're matching themselves up. Um, this is later on in the season, so I gave them releases depending on what I wanted. So I, I put on my outside hand, it was a speed release. Put on my inside hand, it was a stem release. So they're just working. They don't know what they're going to get. I just put one hand under the up, and then they get to go whenever they want to. Again, it's not on my command. It's off of their visual key. So as soon as this guy goes, this guy's got to react. But as he reacts, as he motored back, this guy worked laterally down the line of scrimmage. He wants to work laterally down the line of scrimmage. He does not want to work at a 45-degree angle this way. He wants to work laterally and try to maintain inside position. Again, trying to keep those toes square so his hips are square and get to that leverage point back to inside. He will key that inside hip pocket. So they started out with this progression. He worked this way, excuse me. He worked that way. Okay, and then now he he's going to work back to get to that inside hip pocket with inside eyes. Okay. A break release for us is just a guy committing at the line of scrimmage and going now. He's already turned his hips. He's already going. He's, like I said before, it's most likely cracking the safety or working an under route from here. Again, this is one of our weaknesses. Okay, We're playing motor technique. We're leaving the line of scrimmage. We're soft. We're physically going to be over the route. We're going to be a little bit more susceptible for a radical inside charge. So how do I combat that, okay? One thing, how do I combat it? Okay, their initial alignments is slightly more inside, okay? Slightly more away from their leverage point, okay? Another way, as they work inside and I see that hip com uh, commit, okay, I'm going to now attack downhill and get to that tip of the shoulder uh, of that wide receiver. So I'm going to still be working laterally, just like the stem steps that I did before, but now instead of giving ground still, because knowing the wide receiver can still push, push vertically, he's now attacking inside. I'm going to attack downhill and try to work to a cutoff angle. That's my ultimate leverage is if I could get that cutoff. Most likely he'll never get there, but him working downfield will get his hands on that wide receiver a lot better. Therefore, I could disrupt that inside charge. If it's a, if it's a crack, I'm disrupting that inside charge. Eyes are seeing crack, and I can replace late. Okay? If it's an inside route, I'm trying to disrupt that inside charge. If I miss and I'm slightly behind, I could grab and slingshot. Okay? If I do win and I beat it, well, I'm in a good position. I'm inside of him again, and now he has to go over top, to me, over top of me to get to wherever he needs to go. He's not making the crack no more, so he's going to try to block me. So that's my progression. So as he works laterally inside, the wide receiver's hips are already committed inside. He's working laterally. They started on the same line that I've been showing you so far. They started over here with good inside position. That wide receiver attacked inside. He is going to work laterally. Again, I would really like their toes to be square as much as possible. Okay. Um, and I want him to squeeze his hand placement. I want him to attack the V of the neck and the outside shoulder point. 
little, uh, he's a little tight here with his hands being close together. If he misses completely, he misses all – he misses the whole wide receiver. But if he has the V of the neck and the outside shoulder pad, if he misses with one, he connects with the other. Okay, so I want a little bit looser hands or wider hands, I should say, at that point. But again, I'm wanting them to come downhill and attack that wide receiver as he goes on that break release. Juke release for us is him working outside and radically coming back inside. So he's trying to widen us for a reason. He's trying to get us to open our hips, to overcommit away from him, um, and then come back radically inside. Uh, the key coaching point I told my guys is, is the fact that the, the, the wider the angle they leave on that speed of release, the higher the percentage that they're coming back inside. The wider the angle they leave, the higher percentage. Okay, most guys, if they're going to speed release and they're trying to get vertical or trying to just get outside your framework and go vertically up the field as fast as they possibly can. The wider he's getting, well, he's not getting vertically. He's getting wider because he's trying to pull you to get back underneath. Again, our good eye progression and working our eyes to that far hip pocket at the, that will help us see that near hip, uh, that far hip coming back. When that does come back, I'm not a stab, re-stab guy and open my hip. I'm a working to a stab and he comes back, I'm a two-hand collision to cut off that route. Because again, if they do a juke release, the ball usually is in the air or it plans to be in the air probably a second after he comes back in towards you. Yeah. So the same mirror steps, the same 45 degree angle push, the same same leverage push with the opposite leverage foot. Okay, my eye progression is looking the same to that far hip pocket. Now that hip pocket comes back towards me. Now I'm trying to reroute or shock him and cut off that route, try to get in, in phase for that, that, that pick. Yeah. So same drill you saw earlier. I'm sitting over here. These guys don't know what they're going to get. Is it going to be outside release, inside release? We're getting towards the end of that five-minute period that we're talking about. Guys have gone maybe once or twice, you know, through. Now I'm throwing a little wrinkle into it. Okay? I told this wide receiver to work outside, come right back in. So he, he's working that 45-degree angle. He's got good eyes. His eyes are down to that far hip pocket. He sees that drop and that drive coming back in. He's going to take – Instead of just taking this, this left hand of his or that, that stab hand, okay, he's going to take both hands and he's really going to shock that wide receiver. And I don't think that's something that I mentioned before. I have two terminologies. If they're going to one hand stab it, it's one hand. Thumbs up, palms in, elbows locked, and they're, stab they're stabbing it with one hand. If they're going to shock somebody, I tell them you're trying to get both hands on that target. Okay, so they know the difference when I say I want you to stab something compared to I want you to shock something. So in this situation, he comes back. I'm looking to get back to a shock. I'm looking to bring that right hand back down on that shoulder because that will help me open my hips to, towards him, close off that route, and be able to get to that interception point inside of him and take the ball. Okay. Vertical release is just him attacking me vertically right up the field. Um, I don't have any drill footage or, or clips on this that I can show you guys right now because we didn't drill it. We kind of just went with it. Yeah, the understanding piece of it is as I motor back and that guy vertically charges me without no lateral leverage, stem, or, or, or speed, and he vertically attacks me, the biggest thing I want to do is shock to go. So I talk about having you know a 2-1 two -one, two -one mentality. Okay? If he's going to vertically attack me, I want to become the aggressor. I'm going to shock you. Okay, and then I'm going to work to where you want to go. Um, goods and bads of that, okay, if I shock and I'm physically attacking you this way, well, now if they do a, a simple swim, they can get by you, okay. Um, positives of, of that, you become the aggressor. Uh, how you can limit that of them getting by you is decrease the amount of aggression that you come at with. So I want to I want to get to my footwork underneath me, and I want to be able to have two hands and really react to it like an ambush technique. That is a different technique, a counter technique to your to your motor um, down the line. So those are our counters to to what we naturally do if we have a wide receiver that is attacking us vertically or attacking us trying to get outside of us quickly and to get upfield. Okay. Route recognition phase. So we went all, we went on, we went through all the pro proactive and reactive footwork. Okay, how to how to defend stems, you know, speed releases, juke releases, all that. Now we're getting into that second phase. So we're getting into that that piece where okay, they've already they've already mo uh, mirrored out. Okay, they've already speed released us out. How do we identify routes? How do I get my eye progression right? How do I get into a good locked out body position and understand what might be coming towards me in that new intermediate breaking point. Right? So 
what I do is I'll put them in that situation. So if we see a speed release, sooner or later, this DB is going to work at 45 degree angle, 45 degree angle, and this wide receiver is going to have to work back vertically. He cannot just go on a speed release and run at this 45 degree angle away from him and essentially just be good. He's going to run out of, out, of, out of bounds. So sooner or later, he has to get vertical. When he gets vertical, we're going to be at a good inside position, be able to stab okay, and be able to run from there. That intersection point usually happens between five and six yards, usually. So I want a good stab by about, I tell him, between four and six yards. And then you have, a, you have enough time to get your body in the right position before the next breaking point. That's how I identify my routes. I want to be in a good body position, thumbs up, elbows locked, okay, over top of that route and my eyes down because I know the next breaking point is going to be at 10 to 12. So we drill that. We already put them in that breaking point. We already put them about four to six yards. I already have their hands off on him, and he's in a low stance. He's already opened at a 45-degree angle, and I tell those wide receivers or the guys uh, imitating the wide receivers to run what an outside charge and to vertically get upfield. And then essentially, I want to get that DB to transition from a mirror – which is a 45 degree shuffle to a crossover run as he gets vertically upfield while his eyes are down and I'm in that good position. So when he's getting to that position, he still wants to have good inside leverage. He wants to have that good arm out. Okay. He wants to be physically on top and he wants to get to that position and be ready to break on drive at about 10 to 12 yards. Okay. We all are DB coaches probably in here, probably some wide receiver coaches. We all understand that, you know, the sideline to the bottom of the numbers is seven yards, eight yards, nine yards, you know. So I basically are, are putting, putting them at that four to five yard range and I'm seeing them transition and I want them at a good crossover run physically over top by the time this guy gets past the top of the numbers. That's technically around 10 yards. Okay. And at that point, if he continues on that vertical charge, he's got two routes. He's got that vertical where I can transition into a long lean locate, or he's got that deep comeback where I can come uh, where I can see that come out of it. Okay. This will also help us on how we're going to attack back shoulder fades. So if we have a good stab on that guy and we know that they're a back shoulder team, there, there's a couple teams in our conference. I won't mention them because I don't want you to understand that I know them, but. But some teams, our, our conference does a really good job with some back shoulder throws. We will change our, and we'll adjust our technique at this point, and we'll leverage more on top and be able to drive that back shoulder a little bit better. But it all stems with this initial stab. The stab is weak, or, or if we don't have that right there, we're going to fall naturally inside. We're going to get even, and that guy is leaving. So going from there, okay? The next progression off of that, well, now is I'm going to put him in the same position. Now I'm going to teach that wide receiver to go wherever he wants. I want him to pass, again, the top of the numbers, and then he could break wherever he wants. At 10 to 12 yards, he can run a curl. He can run deep out. He can run a fade. He can run, he can run, he can push him vertically, okay, and run back to the post. I don't care, okay? So I'll put him in that same position. They'll work their mirror steps. They'll get to this crossover run with their eyes nice and low, and now they're working all the releases, the route recognition, and they're seeing their hips drop and driving and getting to where they need to go from there, okay? On the, on the flip side, if we see a stem, okay, we'll do the same thing to get into that route recognition phase on the stem routes, okay? So we're going to line them up. They want them to stay square, okay? They'll have separation between them. I'm going to tell that wide receiver to work laterally down the line of scrimmage and then vertically push and go wherever they want. So uh, through this drill, we're, we're doing the same thing. Um, this, we're at the second part of this drill. He's going to work laterally down the line. He will work his stem and stay laterally, but give some depth because his hips never committed. And then I'll have him vertically push. And then at two steps, he could either continue in on a quick under, he could continue on a slant, he could continue on a vertical and try to run through him, or he could continue back out on a corner route or outside fade, depending on how you want to look at it. Because we had teams last year that want to push stem us but still vertically charge us on a vertical fade route from there. So we will work our footwork, we'll work that stem work, and then he gets back to the vertical charge and gets back to that vertical outside uh, fade route. We'll get back to a mirror to a stab and try to stay on top of that. But that's our progression versus uh, – that's how we get into our route recognition phase. So we emulate just the stem piece and then get to whatever routes, most likely routes we're going to see with that stem, which 90% of the time is inside, inside stem, inside breaking route. 
outside stamp, outside breaking route. But we do char we do try to give them some change ups and go opposite of what they're going. Okay. So those are our, our big two: uh, mirror to a stab, stem, uh, stem to our breaks. Okay, those are our two big two. From there, then we go to our finished phases. And now we're talking about everything from in phase to out of phase work. Okay, how do you handle uh, when I say in phase, out of phase? Most of you guys will understand that if you're a younger coach. Uh, we're talking about how what is my body position close to that wide receiver? Can I touch him? If I can physically touch that wide receiver, I'm considered in phase. I have the right to look back to the ball. I have the right to go up and go get the ball. If I'm out of phase, I cannot physically touch that wide receiver. We talk about going through three progressions, hips, eyes, hands. Okay, I'm going to see his hips. If they drop, I got to change direction. If his eyes come back, okay, I know he's probably done with his route. And then finally, if I'm still out of phase, I'm going to attack through your hands. Okay, so we're going to go through in phase and out of phase drills. It doesn't matter if we're playing motor mirror or off man or what, however we're playing man to man technique. Okay, we're going to work through those drills at all possible. Okay, um, and then we'll work some in phase hip drills where the guy's just dropping down and we're driving to whichever way that hip drops. Okay, and then we'll work some out of phase hand stabs in different ways. Okay, uh, coach, how am I doing? Time wise, you're good, coach. Okay. I'm going to try to get to some film so I can just show these guys a little bit of what I have. Um, and it'll probably take my, another five to eight minutes. Take five time, to, man. And take then time. we should be solid. Cool. You got a question here, Coach. Uh, Perfect. Th is there a point on the field where you might look back over the inside shoulder as opposed to lean and look? Yes. So there is a point on the field. Well, we talk about uh, as that field reduces. So we're talking about the red zone right now. As the field reduces, okay, we have a higher uh, higher likelihood for quick back shoulder throws um, in that red zone. So we will look and we'll we call it face guard. Okay, it is face guarding. I'm going to be on top, physically on top, especially with this motor technique, and I'm going to work leverage point. So when that near shoulder pushes back, I'm in that good position to go in front of you and take away that ball or knock it out. Um, if we have a back shoulder type team, you know, we understand, we, we chart where they throw the back shoulder. You'll be able to see, you know, are they a deep back shoulder type team? Are they a seven to eight yard back shoulder type, type team? You know, they, the teams could only drill that so many times. They, they're, I've never found a team yet to be a deep back shoulder type team and a quick back shoulder. It's one or the other. So I will tell our guys what to expect and we will alter our technique Accordingly, in order to defend the deep back shoulder, we might still lock, lean, locate, but I'm going to be more low hip instead of high hip. Okay? Or we, if we're going to if we're going to guard against a quick back shoulder, then we might face guard in certain situations or certain techniques, motor, where I'm going to play on top of that route and be able to manipulate the guy okay, with my body during that during that area. Okay, so just to go through the drills um, now, most of this stuff has been came out a little blotchy. So um, I hope you guys can see a little bit of it, but um, we're going to our motor start. So this is where we were just talking about, just a, just a quick trigger by somebody, either me or, or the wide receiver, and then working just straight down the line of scrimmage, okay? So I am going to, I'm up here, here. So this is the bad one, okay? So this is, this is our, 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 our corner here. He triggers, okay, and he works down the line, but as you guys see, he fell off the line. And he did this because I told him to do it because I, I wanted him, I wanted, I wanted to see, you know, a visual so I could show my younger corners when they're coming in what not to do. Okay. But a lot of younger corners will do this. They'll physically just come off that line and that wide receiver never went in, went anywhere. Okay. Uh, a good look would, it would be the same type of drill we're working here, and he's just gonna stay on that line. So here's your hot feet. Okay, your toes are being radical up and down. They're not sliding. He's on the balls of his feet. His chin should be staying low. His hands are above his knees. Okay, and he should be working okay, his footwork all the way back. Okay. The uh, mirror underneath the shoots that I showed you. We'll do the same type idea. So the uh, DB's on the line. Okay, I'm inside there. I'm telling him where um, where his leverage piece would be, where's the inside, where's the outside. I give him some type of trigger, whatever it is and he works straight back. As you can see, his first couple steps, okay, he moves the near foot first, but he works, he, he, he kind of cheats the drill right now because I'm telling him I'm going to give him outside release and I want him to work the mirror steps, okay? 
some of the coaching points that you want when you mirror when you open up at 45 degree angles and you see that 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 non uh, opposite leverage foot touch the ground i want that foot to touch the ground as close to him as possible some guys will step and they'll step way over here to go that way and you'll really see it versus the stem steps they'll step outside of their core okay to go the opposite way so you really want to get that step to be underneath them 45 degrees okay opening up those hips okay try not to point that toe because if i point the toe i point the hip right um, I want I want to stay low and under control, okay. And I want to get depth and width, not just one or the other. Okay, this is a bad for me because he, he's working. He's trying to do that hot feet, but he never he never gets width over there. He just opens up his hips and he's kind of just staying on that line, kind of going back. Okay, so our stems. Okay? Our stems. So here's that drill I was telling you about. They didn't know if I'm putting point left or right or which way. See, I'm uh, uh, IBs over there like asking me which way to go. Okay, we're gonna go this way on this one, and then he's gonna work physically just work down that line. Now this is a bad one. What I want that guy to do is to push step and to stay inside laterally. So you see how he, he lost it right now? He, he, he was he was expecting an outside release. He wasn't reading the drill. He wasn't reading his eyes. Okay, so he already lost his leverage. He already got beat. So this is like the third day that we, uh, third time we started working this drill. And that brings me up a good point, okay, for my younger coaches in the room. Okay, anytime I bring a drill in that I had to teach, and I, these all these guys had to learn my drills, you know, from day one all the way through because this is my first year here. Um, I go through three progressions, okay? Listen, learn, live. So the first time we go through a drill, we're, 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 I'm either chalking it up or we're walking through it, okay? Second time we're going through the drill, we're trying to do it about half speed. You're learning the drill. We're never doing it full speed. And then the third time, I'm trying to progress them to get to that live phase, okay? So this drill right now, we're still in a lit, uh, learn phase. We're still going half speed, and guys are still trying to understand what they're trying to do, okay? So understand, understanding what the drill is. This is a good job here. Okay, he motors back. Okay, he can continue to gain depth right here because that wide receiver never commits his hips. His hips still stay square the whole time. So he could give a little bit depth and expect it. I just want to make sure that his eyes are looking at that near hip pocket. So when that hip pocket disappears and this hip comes this way, he could break and drive. Or if that hip pocket works vertically, he could work vertically. If that hip pocket goes back outside, he could work to a stem. Okay, excuse me, to a mirror. Okay. I just want to make sure his eye progression is going in the right direction on that inside release. Boom. And sooner or later, if that guy gets hands on me but never commits his hips, I will get a shock into it to stay to hold my inside ground. Okay. Here's your stem, your motor to a motor, okay, to a to a brake release. He's committing his hips right now. He's just taking that one step and he's going inside. I want that DB to shock him, just like the picture you saw. Hey, remember what I was talking about? Those hands are a little bit too tight for me. I want the V of the neck. I want the outside shoulder. Okay. And I want to try to attack downfield on any type of inside release. Okay. This is a good guy that you could see a little bit about when I talk about in a mirror, you want to push step and compare to a reach grab and continue with you. Okay. Watch this guy's feet. Okay. As he, as he pushes down, he pushes down with this foot and he pulls this foot with him. What happens here is he gets to the point where he's double off the ground a lot. His toes, both toes are off the ground, and if this wide receiver did some type of move where he slapped this guy and came back the opposite way, he's going to be in a bad position. So one of the things we work with with this DB is the fact that he really, on his mirror steps or on his tra transitions, he wants to step. And that was a much better job here. I don't know if you guys could see it. Um, but that was a better job with him push stepping instead of reach stepping. Okay. Uh, don't want to open the hips. We talk about those the um, the toe, right? Okay. This is attacking my leverage right now. Look at his toe. His toe opens. His hips open, and then he has to close his toe back up, and his hips close back up. That toe is vital. That toe opens up, your hips open up. And the same thing I'm going to talk to him about when we get out of breaks at the top of routes. So if we're playing off man and we want to tilt, turn, and we got a break and I got to go a certain way, well, I'm going to point that toe a certain way to get to where I need to go. So wherever your toe goes, your hips will follow. And, it, and it's exactly the same in this technique. So when he sees this break, I want to get down and make sure I'm under control. Okay. 
Uh, here's your one uh, juke release, the, uh, the picture I showed. So this was the end of it. Then I told him, okay, go out, come back in. I'll just let it run. So it hopefully is not as jittery, but he's going to go, he's going to, he's going to work his motor mirror. And then he's working that two hand shock, trying to get back to that inside lever to stay inside of that stuff. Yep. Um, your stab room runs. This is where, this is now we're in the route recognition phase. Okay. We're stabbed up. Okay. This is again, we're in the learning phase. This is the second time we've done this drill. Okay. We're, we're going half speed. They're going to physically run. So you could, you should see them mirror shuffle to a crossover run and stay physically on top of the route. Mirror shuffle to a crossover run. Stay physically on top of the route. So same thing here. Watch, watch this DB's toes. As soon as he starts pointing that toe, he's opening his hips. So the first two shuffles, I would really like him to keep that toe square because you don't know what's going to happen. But after that, now, now you can release that toe and be able to open your hips and be able to cross over run from there. All right. So this is just getting him into the next drill that I need them to get to. So this is a bad. As you can see, he's now even with them. Okay. He's not on top of them. He's even with them. They haven't even passed 10 yards. He's got a lot of routes to still go. He could run an in, he could run a curl, he could run an out, he could run a dig, or he could run vertically. Right now, if he runs vertically right now, my guy is screwed. Okay, he wants to be on top of that route through that intermediate break point as much as possible. Okay, and go from there. Okay, so another bad one. Uh, stab lock lean. So this is the this is the first time we worked the lock lean. So that I put them in the stab position. They're shuffling. They're crossover running. And they're lock leaning. So th this is really, really the listen phase. We went in the classroom. We chalked it up. This was pre-practice. Okay, we came out here. We were, we're learning the drill. We're listening through the drill. Okay, we try to get to that lock position. Now, when I'm talking about a lock position, I tell the, the, the DB I want to get his, op his hand from a, a stab to a lock. So that lock is really I'm going to take that thumb. I'm going to cross his body. I'm going to try to pick the opposite hip pocket. I'm going to lock my shoulder into his shoulder pad as I lean to locate the ball. So a lot of uh, some DB coaches talk about look lean, lo uh, look lean. I'm a lock lean locate. The last thing I want to do is locate the ball okay? because I want to make sure that I'm in that position hip to hip with him before I look back because if I'm not and I'm just running, that guy's going. I'm looking back and I, I don't have that lean position. That guy's taking off of me and I'm losing him neck to get neck to neck. Okay. So that was just the first part of that drill. Okay. Some finish drills we do. Okay. We'll put guys out of phase. So I'm out of phase. They gotta remember what we talked about. We got a, we got hips, thighs, hands. So he's working back to the hands, punching through the hands. Yes, coach. Uh, <clears throat> coach uh, is asking for a vertical route. Can you go through your eye progression from level one, uh, two to three, as well as when you're in phase, even and out of phase? Okay. Easiest piece is right here. Okay. So my my, fir my first piece, uh, playing motor. So I'm going to talk about all playing motor, eye progression. Okay. As, I, as he lines up on the line of scrimmage, his eyes are going to be on that near hip pocket right through here. Okay. Uh, he would be nice, that good alignment as he motors back. And this guy takes a speed release because most verticals are done with a speed release. His eyes are now going to transition to that far hip pocket as I mirror. Okay, so you're going to see right through here, they should be looking at that far hip pocket. Okay, yeah, and then now, now they're at a crossover run. So, so crossover run. Um, so he'll be looking at that far hip pocket. And then when we get to that, uh, when we get through the intermediate break point, when I know there's only two routes left, then I get to that lock phase. So eye progression be near hip, far hip, because you. He releases outside of me, staying far hip in a stab position through the route recognition phase, staying far hip, staying far hip, good, and then boom, lock me low key. Hopefully that answered it. Okay. Uh, drills, uh, like I said, in phase, out of phase. Now we're talking about out of phase. He's going to be coming up, punch through the hands, get the ball out. Great job punching through. Okay, great job. Okay, getting it out. Boom, punching through. If I can't punch the ball out, then I'm going to uh, rip the arms apart as I start coming back down. So I'm really trying to get through, and I'm really trying to rip the arms apart. I don't want to go up with just one hand. I want to try to punch through, but the second hand is coming through and going to rip the arms apart as that sucker goes through. Okay, better job here. Okay. Obviously, he didn't get the height that he wanted to to get to the job, but he got his hands apart, and the ball comes out. All right, coach.
think that's what I got. I got six more minutes for anybody who has any other questions. Yeah, guys, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to hit the chat. Uh, it's open, so just make sure, uh, you know, you just hit the chat. But <clears throat> once again, um, Coach, if you uh, do you want to share just your contact information again? Yep, bringing it up right now. Here we go. There you go, fellas. Make sure you're uh, locked in and, and take down Coach's contact information. Feel free to ask any questions right now. Uh, yeah, anything you do drill-wise, for when a wide receiver tries to push off, uh, push off and stab you. The whole, the whole aspect of me having that stab position, creating that space, is taking that push off a little bit away. Okay, um, I actually played wide receiver in college, so I wasn't fast. I wasn't fast at all. So I had to utilize all those push offs, those swipe buys, and everything like that. So why I ask my guys to stab and continue that lock position is to create some space so I can re react to wherever he wants to go. The only push off he has is that swipe through. And if I stay on top of the route, even the swipe through, could, I can react to it and still cut off the inside route. So just by having that stab kind of takes away the majority of my problems that I usually would get if I was neck to neck on that intermediate break point between 10 and 12 yards, if I was hip to hip on him and condensing that space during that time, well, now I'm getting all these swipe buys, these push offs, these wings, you know, from the comeback on the comeback, all that type of stuff. The only one I do see is if I'm in a lock lean locate and I get that last shove to get that out of bounds ball, high ball, that's when I see. And then I talk about what we did in lock and lean them out of bounds close enough. We want to get to, my ch I challenge them to get on that lock lean to push them to the far hash. So that hash marks that are sitting on the sidelines. Because as a wide receiver, we're always taught to run the line. That red line is about about right on the bottom of the numbers, you know, about a yard on the bottom of the numbers, and, and, and try to sit on that line and then be able to progress and have all that space. So I want to get them off that line, okay, all the way to the bottom of the hash marks as much as possible. How often do you practice your in-phase versus out-of-phase drills? It's fun because actually we do it like pre-practice. Um, so there's not, I couldn't, I didn't download the tape, but we have, uh, we have a drill with simple. It does, so we don't have to be warmed up at all. And, and we just talk about, okay, punch through and out of phase. So we're just right there next to each other. We're working our arms and then boom, we bring it up. And the other DB is working his arms, he's punching through. So we do a lot of that stuff, our out of phase work and, you know, our in phase hip work where we're just working leverage pieces and dropping my hips and driving pre-practice um, just to warm our feet up and kind of just concentrate on our eyes and make sure that, that we're punching through hands instead of swiping through stuff. Well, your progression for the season usually begin with motor or an aggressive first oh. jump press. Great, Ken. Great question. I meant to. I wrote it down in one of my notes to actually uh, talk about. I will um, when I bring in techniques. I'll always start with motor. Um, it's. It, I'll start with motor and then go go to pier and then go to jump press and then usually go to ambush and then go to you know whatever else I might have. It's good. So usually about four is about as much as I had when I was at Eastern or the last place I was at. I was there for seven years. My guys knew all of them. Um, here we are just getting into a little bit of pure step, a little bit of jump press, you know, and getting good at that type of stuff. But I always start with motor. I think it's the safest one you have. If I if, if I ever went to a defensive coordinator and said you could only have one, uh, I would probably be motor because then I'll physically be on top of the route and be able to play everything from top down. Uh, if you're even versus fade route, what's your technique? Uh, do you read the jaw and go through the man? Uh, and I guess yes. Gus wants to know if it changes in the red zone or how it is in the red zone. Yes. If I'm even and, and I didn't get to the lock, the lock phase um, and I'm, uh, I'm already out of phase, I would want to go through the man. I want to turn shoulder to shoulder, chest to chest, and work through his, eye, through his arms as much as possible. In the red zone, it is a lot of face guarding. Um, I don't have clips on here, but when we get in that red zone, we're playing red zone fade. I'm staying on top of the guard. I'm not looking back for the ball. I'm chest to chest. I'm, I'm trying to run through him late look. So, yes. Uh, how many corners uh, do you try to play in a game? Do you rotate by series or uh, can you feel like, can you feel that they're tired? I, I rotate a lot. And it's, uh, it's something that Bo Baldwin uh, uh, taught me. I was never a rotate a lot type guy um, until I got to Eastern Washington and uh, he demanded it out of us with, to to rotate our guys and to have guys fresh at all times. I don't have a, a, a particular schedule that I go at. 
Um, but I do rotate a lot. I do have a feel for the guys, and I'm lucky enough here to, to be on the sideline, not up in the booth. So it allows me to quick change guys. So my, my, my top two starters of that week, you know, it depends week to week. The starters have changed every week because I make it very competitive during practice during, throughout the week to determine who the starters are, and that's built into a whole nother presentation and whatever. But, um, but the starters will usually get the first two series, at least the first two series, maybe the first three series. I might rotate two and two all together, like new two, two new guys come in, two new guys come off, or I might rotate through, like some guy stays in for two first two series, then he stays in the third series, a new corner comes in, then that thir- that original starter comes out, then a new corner comes in, and we're just rotating through. Um, but I do play probably about four corners at least, and maybe a fifth if I got a good a guy good enough. Uh, backpedal or shuffle techniques? Uh, tech- backpedal, 100%. And uh, off man is backpedal walk. I'm a true believer. I, I believe in uh, backpedaling, staying square, being able to break and drive. A lot of people say it's a lost art, but I, I believe in it. Um, I trigger all my off man technique off of timing. So just like your motors, you know, we, our back pedals are three step walk. So it's a timing mechanism walk. So on that third step, I'm going to push and pedal or plant and drive and come downhill um, and, and disrupt the route. But it's, it's back pedal 100%. The only time I, I shuffle is if that wide receiver might be inside leverage or, or close to the core formation and I'm on the outside leverage. What's the biggest thing you look for on tape when recruiting a kid? Top thing I look for, uh, I would say, uh, I mean, of course, the first thing I want to see is speed. But honestly, at our level, uh, speed is is never always a given. I was fortunate enough to recruit a, a kid that ran 10-7 this last year. He had about, you know, four or five FBS offers and, you know, just a great relationship and everything. He ended up coming to us at the end. Um, so that's awesome. But uh, the biggest thing I see is I want to see is footwork. I want to see rapid fire feet. I don't care if they're playing running back, wide receiver. You know, I want to see a guy return a ball, you know, either kickoff return or punt return. I want to see rapid fire feet and quick change of direction. If I can see him put his foot in the dirt and change direction quickly, I can project him a little bit better at playing corner or defensive back. Um, but uh, feet, you know, foremost. If I was at the next level, you know, I would definitely be looking at speed, you know, and, and feet. Yeah, simultaneously. For sure, for sure. Does anybody else have any uh, last minute questions for Coach? Uh, Coach, you come right here. How do you handle? Oh, few came in. How do you handle a player's emotion uh, after a big play? And uh, are you doing any more clinics this season? <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm going to do any more clinics. I did. Uh, I did two before this one. Uh, I did this one because Coach G asked me to. Uh, I appreciate you, Coach G, and that's what you're doing. You uh, uh, so that's the only reason why I did this one. Uh, but uh, how do I handle their emotions during a big play or, or after a big play? Honestly, it's in it's in practice. It's everything leading up to the game. Most of the, most of our emotional stuff, you know, happens during practice. I'll pull a kid in practice if they're screwing something up. You know, so if they did something bad, I'll pull the kid. Um, and so they could feel that that negative energy of, of what happened and how and I will see how they respond mentally. Um, uh, in a game, I usually have a little bit more leeway on a kid. I don't usually try to yank a kid initially unless I have to. Um, uh, but emotionally on, on a big play, they make a big play, they make an interception and they return it or, or something. I try to <laughs> I have to calm myself down most of the time. Well, I'm on the sideline and jumping up and down and I'm. I'm getting too old to be doing that stuff, <laughs> but I'm up there just hollering, uh, hollering, and yeah, I'm joining it myself. So it, it takes me a little bit to calm them down after a big play itself. So uh, you're talking about the, the negative aspect of a big play. It happens during practice. Uh, I, I, I test them during practice, and I put them in situations, practices, and in um, in our environment, uh, in our meeting environment, to fail and feel failure, but also how they react. The biggest thing is how they react when they feel failure. You know. Oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what advice or drills could you run to help a 6'2 and taller corner for initially opening up their stance? Uh, going from inside their framework to outside their framework at the snap, impress. Would you start with their feet wider? Yes. Um, I, I chuckle because I had a, a kid just like that at Eastern. He, he was a 6'1, 6'2 kid out of Samar, uh, Southern California. Uh, he ran straight ahead very, very fast, but he, he struggled with the exact same thing. So what we had to do was you definitely want to widen their stance and give them a little bit more free with freedom there. 
I, I talked about shoulders, you know, shoulder width apart in that bump technique. He could be slightly wider because his footwork is definitely going to have to need it to, in order to be able to be transitioned in and out of that mirror and those stems. Um, what we did was, was well, we pushed them further back too because that motor technique is not really good, or it's, I wouldn't say really good, but it's really it's a lot more difficult for a taller guy to motor consistently with heavier feet than a shorter guy to work quicker. To work quicker, so we pushed that guy a little bit further back. We pushed him out instead of lining up at about a yard off the line of scrimmage. He might have been a yard and a half to two yards, just to give him a little bit more leeway, because uh, we knew he had the range that if he got hands on him, it would be fine. We also taught him the other techniques, um, you know, a, a peer step, a jump press. Those taller guys really, really could get in on top of wide receivers and just defeat guys at the line. And if you teach it properly with everything, you're good to go. So I gave them tools that way too. So the fact that they're, I'm not putting them in that motor situation all the time. Hey, I need you to motor mirror in this, this coverage or that or that situation. But here, you're going to get really good at peer or jump press, and this is going to be your change up to what you normally do. For sure. Uh, anybody else? Last minute questions? What is the best drills? Uh, yeah, what is the best drills or technique to help teach corners when to open before uh, the the cushion is broken? Best drills to teach corners to open or not to open? When to open? When to open? It, it, it's truly a feel thing. Um, the, one of the things I've worked on, and again, it's another whole another uh, discussion or clinic, whatever it is, is understanding leverage. Um, from that off man technique. So if I'm playing off man, I'm going to stay in this frame of mind um, when I'm going to open and have to run with a wide receiver. I'm playing off man and I went from my primary key, my quarterback to my second secondary key and my man, and he stemmed me. Well, I talked to him about counseling out routes in their head because if he stemmed me, there's not a lot of wide receivers that are going to stem a, wide, a DB and walk vertically run through you, right? He's stemming you for a reason. So as he stems you and he works towards you, you got to start thinking about now my inside release, I'm thinking more inside routes. I might still get an outside fade late, okay, but he's not going to run through me. So on that notion, okay, if he holds that leverage to that outside, now i got to think outside breaking routes or late inside breaking routes, okay, the, the posts, the deep digs, all that type of stuff. So and then I'll transition them from an outside, outside release to a tilt to turn. And it's a it's a it's something I, I got way before Eastern Washington, the way before I was at Southeast Missouri State. It's just opening up their their heels to help them open their hips before they got to turn and run to that vertical route. Um, it's really hard to explain without uh, film work, but um, but that's something that I would definitely will teach a kid is how to tilt to turn on our outside fade release because that will help them open their hips to run with that guy and understanding their cushion to get out and go. Uh, in cover two, how do you teach your guys a progression? Uh, cover two progression, uh, for, for me, depends on what cover two we're playing. So if we're playing a, a hard technique, so again, in cover two, I'm very similar to a bump. It's either hard or soft. If it's a hard technique in cover two, I'm going to, I'm going to reroute, exit, sync, QB. That's my four progressions. I'm going to reroute first. Okay, I'm going to exit. Exit is, a, is opening my hips up to the core formation and working vertically. Okay, sinking uh, two shuffle steps while I read the progression of number two. Sinking is getting depth, top of the numbers, two and through the numbers, and my final cues of QB. So that's my that's my hard technique if I'm playing squat. If I'm playing uh, if I'm playing a soft technique, a Kathy or a trap or something like that. Now my eye progression is quarterback to number two. So I'm going to work uh, basically a read progression from quarterback to two to exit, sync, QB. Awesome. Uh, we're good, Coach, man. I, I appreciate you jumping on, man, and, and uh, you know, giving us that presentation and then obviously answering a bunch of questions at the end. So um, really, really thank you so much for, for coming on with us tonight, man. No problem, man. I enjoy what you're doing. Again, for everybody who's still on, going through this, stay safe, you know, stay inside. Um, spend time with the family. That's the biggest thing we get right now is spending time with that fam our family. My family's upstairs right now, allowing me to stay down here and do this. <laughs> so I'm going to go spend some time with them. So, but thank you very much, Coach G. I appreciate sure. it. I'll be, I'll be sure. on tomorrow, early on, to watch some wide receiver play. Oh. RPO offense, for sure.